Hey guys, Chris here, and I'm Ukraine Canadian. Today is April 1st, 2024, and let's get to the news happening in Ukraine, shall we? So this is not April Fool's, and this is legitimate news. So the Russians, as I've noted yesterday in my previous video on Sunday, so yesterday, one of the largest Russian attacks that we haven't seen in a very long time um, got obliterated, and I've talked about it briefly at the end of the video yesterday. Uh, somewhere around the village of Tonenke. So this is the Avdivka direction. Now we've received an image or several images and also a video that was shared with us by the Ukrainian 25th Brigade that showcased the destruction of this large, large Russian convoy. Again, they mentioned that 36 Russian tanks took part in this assault and 12 BMP slash MTLBs. And as you can see in this image, this is a catastrophe for the Russians. Uh, most of these armored vehicles got destroyed in the process. In the video, you can see that um, it certainly confirms uh, their claims. And um, basically, it's another confirmation that with such losses, Russia demonstrates their inability to have decisive wins. Are they able to chip away territory and gain territory? Yes, but at massive, massive costs. And if we're talking about, as I've mentioned yesterday, you know, the possibility of the Russians occupying Kiev or Kharkiv or even Odessa. I mean, this is a pipe dream. It's complete nonsense. It takes them huge amount of resources just to take a small city or a small village like the one Tonenke. I'll show you guys where exactly this occurred, uh, this, um, this Russian assault, which occurred Saturday, so on March 30th. So you can see that this is the Yevdivka direction. This is the small village of Tonenke, probably less than 500 people lived there prior to the war. And I believe that this convoy was right here. You can see that there's a very sharp turn and there is a body of water behind. And I think this is where the Russians were trying to push on this main central road that leads into Tonenke, but also leads into uh, the other villages that the Russians are trying to capture. Um, Umanske, Yasnobrodivka, and also Semenyevka. So these are the heights that the Ukrainians currently control. Uh, I'm mentioning heights, but these aren't really heights. They're just an elevated uh, body, essentially. It's not like it's a mountain, but it does give the Ukrainians some advantage. Even a few meters uh, above uh, normal ground does give an advantage to the defenders. So you can see that this is where the Russians most likely lost uh, dozens of tanks and BMPs on Saturday. And that really corresponds with the image. If we're looking at it with more detail, you can see that there's a body of water, sort of a stream running through, and there's this turn uh, right here, this kind of sharp turn. So uh, again, as I've said, the Kremlin knows that they cannot, they absolutely cannot um, you know, win this war and occupy Ukraine. And the scale of devastation, the scale of destruction of their own army really showcases that. And again, Russia is also facing internal rebellions and terrorism at this point. ISIS uh, proved that a few weeks ago, that they're just able to go in and one of the most important, well, the capital of Russia, and murder hundreds of civilians and leave without even a trace, right? Until the FSB captured them, apparently somewhere uh, close to Ukraine, but it was actually in Belarus, uh, which there's also many other questions besides that. But you, Russia is facing huge problems right now. and. I am almost certain that after this summer, when the Russians will try to uh, do one last push or one last huge offensive, which everybody is now talking about, and I've shared with you my thoughts where I think the main thrust of this offensive is going to be, which is likely going to be around Chasivyar in Bakhmut. But I'm also uh, not downplaying Avdivka. Of course, the Russians are also trying, will probably do two offensives. So one in, in Chasivyar in the outskirts of Bakhmut and one in Avdivka trying to gain as much control because for them, they absolutely want to capture the two largest cities that are left, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk under Ukrainian control. So by doing these two pushes, one towards Pokrovsk, one towards Konstantinivka. So they need to take Chasivyar before they get to Konstantinivka. Uh, they can then do more operations in the north of Lysychansk and Krimina to get to Slovyansk. So this is kind of going to be this entire sector, the center of Donbass, essentially between Krimina, 
Tovdivka will be their main thrust. But I think more of an, there will be more of an emphasis right now towards Chasivyar. And many Ukrainian soldiers are talking about the fact that the Russians have really increased their artillery uh, on Chasivyar. And they've been using the very, very destructive FAB 500s, FAB 1000, and even FAB 1500 uh, glide bombs, which again, the number um, explains the warhead size. So 500 kilos, 1000 kilos, and 1.5 tons. So very, very destructive weapons that the Russians are using right now to uh, displace the Ukrainian defenses, specifically in Shasivyar. So this is a very difficult situation for the Ukrainians in the outskirts of Bakhmut. So this is Russia's last chance before they realize that they can't push anymore. And uh, certainly, I believe that by the end of this year, the Russians will be asking for a ceasefire. Uh, directly or indirectly, I'm very convinced about that because they absolutely need a ceasefire to rebuild and uh, you know reconstruct their army because it's been devastated by the Ukrainian defenders. So that's the strategy for Ukraine right now. Make it as costly as possible for the Russians so they're depleted to the max. Now, there's some other very positive news uh, that I want to share with you guys. And again, this is not 100% confirmed, but um, it appears that the Republicans and Speaker Johnson uh, will uh, put the vote in motion this month for the Ukrainian um, aid package that was supposed to be voted a few months ago. But now it's taken some time. Again, uh, putting aside all the internal politics, um, it's taken a long time for the United States to pass this aid package. And it seems that there's some positive signs that this will happen this month. Again, it's not 100% confirmed, but you can see that even Speaker Johnson, who has mentioned several times that I'm not passing it, I'm not... You know, we're going to go on a long break before we actually start thinking about it. Now you hear concrete words that they're planning to get this passed. And um, essentially, they're trying to tweak it uh, by adding the possibility of extending a U.S. loan to Ukraine, meaning that instead of just giving this uh, without any strings attached, uh, that the United States will expect the Ukrainians to pay back, um, you know, this loan, whether it be in financial assistance or military um or weaponry being provided to ukraine which to me it's fair enough to my american viewers this is your taxpayers money you paid for it and it's only fair that the united states asks um for ukraine to pay back and to me that is a hundred times better than having russia take over ukraine and then enslave the ukraine population for decades to come and decades to come and then put under threat the european continent at the very least um and it's only good it can only be good for the ukrainians because again um, not only is it going to be beneficial in removing this narrative that, look, the United States is just giving blank checks to Ukraine. I've heard this narrative many times by Americans that are very um, wary of, you know, the aid that's been provided to Ukraine, that I don't want my taxpayers' money going to Ukraine. Look at the United States just giving blank checks. So I think it removes that because now we can say, well, it's not just a blank check. It's a credit that Ukraine needs to pay back eventually, even if it's decades down the line. Rest assured, the Ukrainians will be very grateful for that and they will pay you back. And also, it makes it's ensuring that the Ukrainians are going to be more accountable with these funds and this whatever in whatever form this aid package takes form in, whether it be military aid or even financial uh, aid, uh, it will make the Ukrainians more accountable um, to implement anti corruptive practices within its institutions. Unfortunately, Ukraine. Um, has corruption that is still present. There's been various scandals in the last few years of misappropriated funds. And I think that this will make the Ukrainians more accountable for that. Um, and, you know, of course, if the United States is expecting to be paid back, I think there will be more of an involvement by the United States to make sure that uh, there's no misallocation of these funds, which is a win-win situation, to be honest. The Ukrainians want that. They don't want corrupt officials to start spending money left and right, give corrupt... Um, you know, uh, sign corrupt deals with their friends or colleagues that they know. Uh, the Ukrainians want that money to be spent efficiently. And so this is a win-win situation. And also, uh, Johnson mentioned that the Repo for Ukraine's Act might be included in this, um, in this package, which would authorize the U.S. president to seize Russian sovereign assets uh, frozen in the United States and give them to Ukraine to use against Russia. Excellent. So fingers crossed that this will pass this month. There are some very positive signs coming from the Republicans. And let's hope that this uh, this is a done deal within this month because the Ukrainians absolutely need U.S. assistance. 
we need to recognize that the United States has done a lot for the Ukrainians, but the Ukrainians need just a little bit more um, help from the United States to get this done. Um, and, you know, this will s secure uh, the defense of Ukraine um, at the very least this year, which is very necessary because Putin right now feels very, very emboldened, confident. He sees that there is political infighting in the United States and he feels like, well, you know, this is my chance to uh, try to break down the Ukrainians because they're in lack of ammunition, uh, in money to pay its government workers. And, you know, it's the perfect storm for Russia right now to utilize. So this absolutely needs to pass. Now, last news, and I finish strong, is uh, this is another health and safety moment that was skipped by the Russians in the Uralmash Zavod. So this is a very important plant in Yekaterinburg, so in central uh, Russia, that uh, exploded, essentially, or took fire, I should say. It didn't explode, but it took fire. And actually, we can confirm with certainty that this was the result of a factory worker who brilliantly decided to saw metal with an angle, angle grinder close to a giant open barrel of highly flammable varnish. And one of the sparks, guess what, flew into the container and took fire, as you can see here. And then this was what happened, uh, you know, the, the moment of it happening. And now the entire uh, workshop, one of the workshops of the plant is completely on fire and is a total loss. I need to remind my viewers that this plant produced the T-34 tank back in World War II. So, uh, you know, a tank that is renowned by any, anyone uh, that helped the Soviets in World War II to win against the Nazis. But now it mostly produces heavy machinery. Uh, that are crucial, of course, for the war, war effort, whether it be engineering vehicles, excavators, loaders, the Russians need them uh, to build defenses, defenses, build the railway lines, the connections for the railway, um, the railways that they, they, uh, they're, they're utilizing or repairing them. So this is a huge loss for the Russians. And I mean, I'm very happy, you know, this is a very good initiative that was taken by these Russian plant workers. Uh, so we can only hope that more of this happens in the future. So that's the video for today, guys. Very brief, quick update. Uh, I'm really hopeful that this aid package gets passed. Uh, this bipartisan uh, bill gets passed in the United States because this will give a massive, massive boost for Ukraine. And I personally don't care if it's in form of loans or some other form. As long as it's passed, the Ukrainians will be eternally grateful uh, to America because weapons are a form of democracy, right? You need to defend democracy through weapons as well. If you don't have that, this is just empty words. So the Ukrainians need this military assistance as well from the United States. It's been valuable, invaluable for the Ukrainians for the last two years, and that needs to continue. So thank you so much, guys. Please, if you enjoy my content, please subscribe. Leave me a comment about any of the topics I covered today, what you think. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Slava Ukraini!